welcome to the Business of Story, where we connect you with the leading minds in the art of business storytelling. Learn from best-selling authors, Hollywood screenwriters, makers, content marketers, and brand raconteurs on how to craft and sell compelling stories that sell. The Business of Story is brought to you by Oracle Marketing Cloud, helping businesses use the latest marketing technologies to tell their stories and connect with their customers. Emma, which provides innovative email marketing tools and services that drive brilliant results. Act Content Management Software, organizing all your prospect details in one place so you can prioritize your day and market more effectively. And by Convince and Convert, digital marketing advisors and counselors to leading brands and organizations worldwide. Convince and Convert helps you gain and keep your customers online. Here's your host, Park Howell. Welcome, everyone, back to Business of Story. I'm Park Howell. I'm your host for today's episode, like all episodes. And my job is to connect you, brand strategists, content marketers, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, and businesses of all sizes who need to share your brand story to connect you with story artists from around the world to help you craft and tell compelling brand stories that sell. I also do this over at the website, businessofstory.com. Feel free to go there. There are lots of free brand strategy storytelling tools there, as well as our archive of blog posts and podcasts from the past. Uh, So feel free to dive in. I also have a resource library there for you that you can see every resource that I have been through to help have a better understanding of the power of storytelling in branding and brand strategy, and they're there for you to watch and review and listen to. That's at businessofstory.com. Now, today we have a really great brand story strategist in Nick Westergaard. He is a strategist, a speaker, an author, and an educator. As chief brand strategist at Brand Driven Digital, Nick helps build better brands at organizations of all sizes, from small businesses to Fortune 500 companies to the President's Job Council. Now, Nick has uh, been writing about marketing and fresh brand-driven insights at branddrivendigital.com. He also writes for Marketing Profs and the Gazette, where he is a regular columnist. His thoughts have been featured in news, uh, sources such as U.S. News and World Report, Entrepreneur Magazine, Mashable, American Express Open Forum, and so much more. So we are so lucky, so fortunate to have Nick Westergaard with us today on Business of Story because he is truly a story artist working within the realm of brand development, brand strategy, especially in the digital world. And he has a very cool new book coming out. So without further ado, let's go to this episode of Business of Story with Nick Westergaard. Hey, Nick, welcome to Business of Story. Thank you, Park. I am happy to be here. You know, it's nice to return the favor. I was going back through your site the other day, and I realized that uh, you and I did a podcast on your podcast, the On Brand Podcast, way back in July 27. And that uh, that was like my third show out, I think, of Business of Story. And now we are reaching into the 30s in our episodes. And it's just so great to return the favor and have you here today, especially with the big news of your book coming out. This is true. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, it's funny you talk about all of the, uh, the serendipitous nature of things. I am... Um, no, we're going to talk a little bit about branding, and I mentioned that that was timely because I'm teaching a course now uh, at the University of Iowa on strategic brand positioning, and uh, I just came, uh, I guess, uh, when we're recording this, it was just a couple of days ago that I uh, taught a lecture uh, about the role of story, and in that lecture, I have uh, a couple of quotes uh, from Robert McKee which was an episode that uh, I remember literally taking many notes during. So that was, uh, uh, that was that, that's my plug to go back and catch that episode of this podcast if you haven't listened to it, because that, uh, that was an amazing opportunity. It's not every day that us, uh, us business folk get access to someone like that. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Robert McKee is a real character. And I would also say um, for all the business folk, brand strategists and content marketers out there, 
if you have a remote interest in how Hollywood goes about writing screenplays, I highly recommend Robert McKee's legendary four-day workshop at the L.A. Sheraton, at, at, at the LAX Sheraton. I mean, you're right in the, in the middle of the airport, basically. <laughs> and it is one of the most fascinating workshops I've ever attended. There were about uh, 220 or so screenwriting folks there. And when he asked who were actually trying to you know, make a movie, I would say a good 200 of them were. And the other 10 of us were literally business people. And they're just trying to figure out what does Hollywood know that we should know as, as content communicators and brand strategists to make our stories more compelling and to help them sell better, essentially. So thank you for the plug. He was kind enough to come on the show early when we had first launched the show, too. And he's a pretty amazing character in his own right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But such a such a great uh, opportunity. I mean, to me, that's kind of what uh, uh, you talked about it being early on. And it was like that drove home absolutely like what the podcast is all about. So is bringing the the story to uh to 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 all the suits. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what's been fun about it Nick is that I have had a lot of what I call story artists because I don't know how else to categorize them. They're authors and screenwriters and coaches and in Hollywood r- writers, directors, producers, whatever. And now I'm bringing more um or sprinkling in more of the practitioners, the brand strategists like yourself to talk about how you all use story over at Brand Driven Digital um, and about your book and and what the perfect timing for this book, because I have been pulling my hair out and, you know, gnashing my teeth and waking up at two 30 in the morning to try to figure out how in the world do I make my digital presence for business of story work. And so your book is perfect timing. It's called what? Get Scrappy, Smarter Digital Marketing for Businesses Big and Small. Tell us a little bit about that, and what are you bringing to us to help us get better sleep at night? Well, that, uh, thank you, and that it, it's uh, I, I hope to bring about better sleep. I'm, I'm going to start saying that, um, but uh, it is really a um, it's a framework for kind of rethinking your marketing uh, at this juncture when marketing is rethinking itself, and more than being kind of a uh, a network by network handbook. It is kind of a, more a, a handbook for your thinking in terms of approaching, developing a scrappy strategy, not just a, a great big tabbed binder that sits up on the shelf next to the crisis plan, <laughs> um, but you know, really more of a marketing map for where it is you're trying to go and how you can use the tools of today to get there. Um, and you talk about the the role of of branding and, and really storytelling as well, and that's uh, the first chapter. I talk about how the how the marketing megaphone has changed, but what's behind it hasn't. And I think too many of us rush in to uh, you know plant a flag on the latest greatest social network or form of content without first kind of taking care of who we are and making sure that we have a story to tell as well. Yeah, it's funny that you would put the uh, digital plan right next to the crisis plan, because I feel like a lot of times my digital plan is indeed a crisis (laughs) plan. Um, So many different channels to handle and to get your head around it, especially for a small business if you don't have a lot of staff and even large brands, as you point out in your book. And on your website, um, don't have necessarily the resources in the way of people and finances to really get their arms around their digital strategy. So what are a a couple of the hints that you provide in the book that helps us breathe a little easier um, and be more effective and simpler at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you you hit the nail on the head of of breathing easy, easier and uh, and and thinking more simply. Uh, the book is broken into three parts. The first part is bluntly titled "Smart Steps You Can't Skip," and it is about uh, who you are as a brand and kind of what your what your marketing map is, how you're going to get from point A to point B. From there, we focus in part two on doing more with less. And that's kind of the, the, the meaty center of the book where I focus on three core principles. One is creating a question engine. 
creating marketing that asks questions and answers questions and is kind of powered by that moving forward. The second point is embracing your people power. And too often we kind of think about people in general, the people we're talking to, the people we're working with as a problem, as something that we have to manage, be worried about, as opposed to uh, really uh, being some of our greatest advocates if we let them. Uh, And then the third point there is connecting your digital dots. So we've kind of come upon a time when we have so much new that we actually have a risk of siloing ourselves further and further away from legacy digital marketing systems uh, like our uh, website, like our email, our SEO efforts uh, that are still kind of great bread and butter tools. But as we focus more and more on what's new and what's next, uh, we run the risk of not being able to leverage them with what we're doing uh, with all of these new tools as well. And then the third uh, is really about uh, what you said is about simplification is about um, is about, you know, developing uh, content and social media hacks to help you do more with less over time and uh, to measure what matters. Uh, because measurement, kind of like strategy, can become a big, heavy academic exercise. So uh, we focus on kind of bringing all of that back to the beginning, coming full circle and aligning uh, measurement uh, with what it was that we set out to do, which is kind of where that, that map metaphor pays off. If we know where it is we're trying to go, we know if we've gotten there in the end as well. And Nick, you've been in the brand management strategy world for a long time, and you teach it as, as well. Uh, brand Driven Digital is a wonderful website that I, I go back to time and again because I think you do such a nice job of not only talking about brand strategy and management, but the way you all deliver it digitally is very beautiful. So having said that, there are a ton of books out there that cover this space that you're writing. In your experience, what did you see that Get Scrappy needed to talk about to fill in the voids that you weren't seeing in the other books and content available around uh, digital marketing? Well, one of the biggest things is kind of this scrappy mindset, which I feel like it's a word that we kind of know what it means when someone says get scrappy. But if you ask someone to define it, um, it can go a lot of different ways, even if you look in the dictionary, um, which is why um, in doing that, I, I, I do that at, in the introduction. And uh, you can actually read the introduction for free at getscrappybook.com. Uh, but the definition I like the best is from uh, the wonderful and at times not safe for work uh, urban dictionary. Um, but it's a very G-rated definition of, uh, of scrappiness there that I like that talks about um, someone that appears uh, outmatched by an obstacle, but more than compensates uh, with willingness, persistence, and heart. And uh, it's that mindset that I, I work to kind of capture in this book, because uh, when I was selling the book, uh, publishers kept trying to push it into it's just small business. It's just big business. And I really thought it was both. And uh, because I I talk with both, I work with both. And um, one of my favorite stories that I've put into the introduction, and I think I mentioned it a couple of times in the book, is um, when I was talking with uh, the marketing manager at Schwinn, the bicycle company. And we think of them it's funny how we we have these big and small buckets because it might be easy to think of Schwinn as a big brand. Uh, but I've been to their global headquarters and it is uh, a small operation. You know, they don't have many on their marketing team. And I was explaining this concept uh, to Samantha Hersel at Schwinn uh, of, of Scrappy. And she said, she was nodding along and she said, you're right. She said, I think that we could all, regardless of size, Uh, use a few people and a few dollars more. And most of us aren't getting that. So how can we, you know, Apple puns aside, think a little bit differently about the task at hand. So that is what I hope this book does is it, it has a bit more uh, of a mindset approach to it. And while I reference the channels of today, I hope that it is not only for the channels of today. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Well, we'll come back to the book a little bit later in the show because I wanted to jump into another area that you are quite an expert in, and that is brand management, brand, in particularly brand positioning. You mentioned it earlier about, you know, in your class. In our work with Business of Story, as you know, Nick, we've got the story cycle process, which is a hybrid of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And we've boiled it down to this 10-step process that brands can use on their own or we can walk them through that um, basically gets them thinking like an author around the strategy of their brand, um, how their meta-marketing drama story is created, and then how they make their stories, share them with their customers who in turn become the storytellers on behalf of the brand. Step number one in our story cycle process is called the backstory. And it's just like you would imagine for any film, book, or whatever, or probably even in your scrappy book, when I read your intro, you gave us a backstory there. We all need to have a setting for our stories. And in uh, brand and brand strategy, that setting is, to me anyways, what is your number one position that you own in the marketplace in the hearts and minds of your customers. And and quite often, this is very much of an operational position. What are you the best at, the biggest at, the smartest at, the fastest at, the most expensive or cheapest at, that sort of thing. But it's critical to set the stage for an overall brand story. And again, using the story cycle process with that chapter one of the backstory, brand positioning. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you approach positioning brands and the importance of it in your work? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's interesting because I am uh, I was charged here this semester with teaching a, a course in strategic brand positioning. So this is all very top of mind, and it's interesting too because I, I love the story approach, and that's definitely more in line with 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 my approach. I think what you have to to contrast that with is you know you get materials on how. Um, you know, how others that have taught this course have approached it. And there's a very academic uh, textbook focused way of uh, market analysis and customer analysis and industry analysis. And there's a place for all of that. But I think it's sometimes hard to get your arms around. And even if you do, um, I don't know that it really feeds the work as effectively as something like this. I, I think it was, uh, it might've been on the McKee episode where he talked about uh, as human, uh, no, this it was because it was uh, it was the quote I mentioned in class the other day uh, that stories are are how we make sense of the world. So I think beyond, <laughs> you know, you con- the contrast comes in, you know, stories versus kind of spreadsheets, and I think sometimes we are we are so afraid of the right brain. Do I have the brain? I always get my brain sides <laughs> the wrong. The analytical brain, or you mean the right. emotional brain? The, yeah, it's it's because mm-hmm. I'm the emotional brain side that I have trouble remembering which side is the analytical <laughs> side. Um, but I think sometimes we're so afraid of the um, squishiness that comes from uh, the emotional side of the brain that we're quick to want to get this into a spreadsheet, that we want to quick to kind of matrix uh, the brand and the marketplace. Uh, but I think uh, I, that's why I kind of cleave to that uh, McKee idea of it, you know, of stories being how we make sense of the world. So we do. It is upon us to come up with what that story is as kind of a a critical factor in, in how we fit into the marketplace. And it seems like uh, you've got a convergence of brand thinkers that all um, you know, kind of have that idea. You talked about what it is that you bring that's unique. I mean, I um, – what I'm using for for my kind of uh, anti textbook this semester is uh, Marty Newmeyer's The Brand Flip, and he talks about onlyness um, in there, and that's kind of uh, it's kind of my go to when it comes to positioning. Uh, Patrick Hanlon, who uh, wrote a great book called Primal Branding, it's funny because he jokes like right before social media, so it's the unfortunate. Uh, thing that can happen to any author, but it was like right before Facebook and everything, but it's a great system. Uh, But he kind of rewrote it as a book called The Social Code. But he talks about um, a uh, a creation story. And I think that that that's where we we have to all fit in. And I kind of uh, pile all of these factors up. And I talk about uh, kind of the stages of brand building that... um, you know, everybody's got their approach, but in, in academia, I have kind of the, the sections that we're kind of working through 
as a course. And the first one uh, where I feel like this is kind of born uh, is um, uh, context, is looking at the marketplace and how we fit into it. And um, that is, I think, what we what we have to do and where story matters. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you mentioned earlier about how you approached it and looked at it first from an academic textbook standpoint. And a, a thought popped in my mind when you are absolutely right. We tend to avoid the emotional value within a brand and we have to codify that, which in my mind also cauterizes it. It just shuts it down and we end up back in this very analytical um, approach to it. When we're working with folks on their branding, the first thing I do is I give them an online form that they can't start and stop on. They have to sit and they have to go through the 10 steps all in one fell swoop. And that's done intentionally. And what I tell them is I want you to do it fast. I don't want you to overthink it, over intellectualize it. I want to know what your gut thinks over your brain. And I find that when we do that first, you really get to see sort of peeling back that onion of raw emotion of what they truly believe about their brand. And then when they come in and sit down and we take them through the workshop, then we get an opportunity to test those emotions with the left brain, that intellectual side. But I always like to start first with the emotion of what does that founder really believe and their lieutenants around them in the leadership truly believe about the brand. And then from belief, we work into what is reality, where are the gaps, and how do you make that work? And I think in uh, positioning, a lot of times that brands go astray because they think they are one thing in the market, even though their customers clearly believe they are something completely different. Have you found that? And how do you coach brands around that particular pitfall? Well, I mean, that's the trickiest part about the whole the whole work of branding is we try as we may, but it is ultimately created in the heart and mind of the customer. So it's where I, you know, the word, the concept I probably overuse are the concept of, of touch points. And, you know, we can architect as many of these touch points as we can and hopefully do around a story, a structure that makes sense And hopefully that kind of repeats and continues to ripple out if we've done our job effectively. But if it's not, you you can't, um, you know, if you go with the 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 rippling metaphor, you can't change the the tide there. Um, You know, you uh, you know, you can't be something that you're not in the marketplace. So it it is very hard work. I mean, it is ultimately something you create, but it has to be accepted and uh, by the marketplace and ultimately based on, on reality too. So I think you do have to, you know, you do have to, you know, it's where, it's where we accidentally end up in spreadsheets, but there's a, an emotional brain way to do it as well. We have to make sure that we're listening. We have to make sure that we, you know, when I talk about context, that we understand the marketplace, that we understand um, what's most important for those that we're serving. Yeah, I think it's really interesting too, because in our hearts, we, in minds, we think we might be serving one master out there in the form of a customer, but find out that how we deliver is actually maybe underperforming there or meeting the needs of a completely different segment that we hadn't really considered before. Well, and I think the, absolutely. And I think the other tricky thing is where the spreadsheet uh, analytical side gets to is that on a balance sheet, it's very easy to really push to be everything to everyone. And I think that strong brands can be, you know, you, you know, you have to look at what stands out, what gets attention and it is bold statements. You know, we're, we're recording this uh, close to the Super Bowl, And I, I know that you can overplay the importance of Super Bowl ads, but I also think that they kind of like the presidential campaigns are very big examples of uh, they're, they're huge, fast case studies with a whole lot of money behind them. So usually they either strike way out or, um, or, or, you know, hit a a grand slam. Um, And in looking at those, you know, I I am recalling the Budweiser one and uh, it was the one about um, 
you know, kind of repeating the the story that they started last year that was a little bit anti craft beer, and you know that it's not small batch, it's not for hobbies. And you know, I was watching it, kind of getting mad, but then I'm like, oh yeah, that that's not me. I, I wasn't buying them from the get go. I'm not buying them after the fact. Uh, they weren't talking to me, and, and they don't need to. So I, I think that even it's interesting and it's easily seen in a brand like Budweiser because as they, you know, kind of approach that kind of massive brand that they are, uh, they have to kind of remake themselves as, okay, if it is a huge time, if their context is in this world where craft beer is, has taken off and is through the roof, what does that mean for the masses? How do they serve their audience different? And I think that they are looking at telling a grittier, more authentic story there that doesn't maybe have to speak to some of us. Hmm. Yeah, very, very good point. I remember that particular spot, too. And didn't it also have like a gigantic container ship coming over and saying that we aren't an import? And yet, yeah. you know, sort of ironically, they are owned by an import, if you will. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> Who, we'll let who him am I that. to judge? <laughs> we'll let him have that. the 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 bigger point it was, uh, it was uh, they were they were they were doing a good job of of talking to their people, or like you said, of of um, you know finding that segment too. And I think that they, you know, are one of those brands born of the three networks of television. And it's like you could just buy an ad and talk to everybody, show yeah. some horses. And uh, that's who we are. And I think that you have to you have to galvanize your people and give them something to rally around. Absolutely. Um, Listen, Nick, we get to take a break right now. And I get to say get to because we have some wonderful sponsors who would like to share their stories with our audience. And when we come back, I would like to talk to you about how is digital change branding or has it and how do digital brands need to be maybe a little bit more focused Uh, than they used to be, as you just mentioned, when you only had three networks that you could buy and promote on. Brands now, the really smart ones, are becoming content producers of of meaningful material that actually empower customers. And how does that change and or focus the positioning of a brand online? So we'll be back right after these messages. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in one place. It helps market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, ACT drives sales. So try ACT free for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise-canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Hey, I've got a question for you. What's the best call to action button color on your website? Yeah, you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? Well, what's the best shape and sizes of your CTA buttons? And what copy gets more clicks? You know, these questions have interrupted my sleep patterns for weeks now until I downloaded a helpful new email marketing guide from Emma called Why We Click The Psychology Behind a Great Call to Action. You'll learn how applying just a little bit of brain science can transform your CTA buttons into small but mighty conversion powerhouses. It covers the button color, copy, and placement that helps skyrocket click rates. Check it out at myemma.com forward slash click. You know, Emma helps marketers everywhere send smart, stylish email newsletters, promotions, and automated campaigns. And to help us all rest a little easier knowing our email marketing is doing its job. So check out their new publication at myemma.com forward slash click. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Nick Westergaard of Brand Driven Digital, an author, and he's just about ready to come out with a new book, or by the time this airs, it may well be on the line called Scrappy, Smart Digital Marketing for Businesses 
big and small. And I got to tell you, I can't wait, Nick, for this to come out because I think I'm a scrappy marketer. But literally, my social and digital plan does look like a crisis plan. I got to try and figure that out so I can be more uh, impactful in simpler ways. But um, right now, we're talking about positioning a brand and the importance of it. And I'm really curious, have you have seen through your work through Brand Driven Digital, um, have brands approached positioning differently now? Or because of the digital realm, has it caused them, you know, of course, going from promoters of stuff to publishers of meaningful content, how has that impacted the brand positioning profession? Well, I think it's a natural um, outgrowth of it. You know, I talked about uh, how I'm kind of dividing up this course I'm teaching. And the, the first section is on context, everything that kind of feeds positioning. And from there, I think we have to focus on some of the traditional branding work uh, of coming up with a, uh, a brand blueprint to help us build brands. And from there, uh, we shift to um, actually the where I'm just uh, heading off to later today uh, to talk about. And that is uh, are the digital dynamics that help us today. And the first one is uh, content. And in thinking of even the the progression of what we've been talking through, I, I think it is staring right back at us because we talk about uh, creating positioning from context that then feeds the stories that we tell. And the single most meaningful uh, development in storytelling, I'd say, from a brand perspective, is the proliferation of content marketing. Uh, it is such a powerful tool in positioning your brand. So in theory, if you've done your positioning homework, if you've built a strong brand that stands for something, then you're teed up to start creating meaningful content around those people that you've identified that we were just talking about before. So I, I, I think it is right there. That said, it's a tricky business to, to be in because most of us uh, on the business side of things, you know, have a, you know, a branding and marketing background. And that in some cases means uh, we came from a, from a journalism school background, but in others, all of a sudden means that we're in the publication business. And I think that that is tricky. Yeah, without question. I don't know if you know um, Michael Gass. He is a um, advertising consultant for new biz development. He's got a great company called Fuel Lines. And I was at his Nashville conference back in October, and I was uh, speaking at it about story, storytelling, and branding. And Michael gets up on his podium, and he will tell you in our line of work in the advertising agency business that you have to have such a direct, clear focus on what you do. No longer can you be a generalist. And I think that is true in a lot of industries out there. And so to give you an example, of the 100 or so agencies that were represented there, um, I would say 10% of them seem to be doing really well. And the other 90 were struggling, still trying to figure out how to get through you know, the, the hangover of the recession and deal with digital and find their true voice and position in digital. And one gentleman um, I was talking to, it was just not a guy you would expect to be in the advertising business. Big guy, beard. Um, he looked like he could have been off of Duck Dynasty. He was out of South Carolina and he was killing it, pardon the pun, as an agency. And I asked him what he did. And his main focus, he says, you know, all I do is focus on clients that build hardwood countertops and cabinets. And I go, seriously, aren't they all competitors of each other? He says, yes, they are, but they're all across the country. But if you want an ad agency that is going to focus on your hardwood countertop and cabinet business, I'm your guy. Now, talking about a brand position and talking about a very narrow focus, and at least in my experience, it has been because of the digital realm is re requiring brands of all ilks across industries to have this kind of laser focus. Would you agree? I, I would. I, you know, um, I, I think that without digital, uh, it would be very hard to uh, maintain that position in the marketplace and also, um, you know, to not uh, to be able to make payroll. Uh, but I think because of that, 
And I, I would say it's largely probably because of the content that uh, he can create that speaks to uh, those businesses out there that are looking for exactly that instead of kind of all of the me too marketing content that we see out there. Uh, Cause I, I, and you know, I, that's kind of back to an idea I talk about in the book and what you were talking about struggling with. I think sometimes with digital, it's too easy to get into um, what I call in the book checklist marketing, where instead of doing some of this homework and figuring out who we're talking to and even dr- drilling down a bit from there, Uh, we want to just check things off of lists because it gives us that dopamine rush. We can feel better about ourselves. The stuff's crossed off our list. We can feel good. We can not feel behind in our marketing. Uh, But it really doesn't produce really great results as opposed to focusing on who it is we're trying to reach and why we're doing this in the first place. Yeah, it all comes back to that audience persona and really understanding who they are and what they care about. And how you are relevant within that scheme and their worldview. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in that, you know, it, it really kind of blurs the lines of, you know, branding and marketing. And, you know, it, it gets into business plan stuff, which I think any good brand plan, there shouldn't be a lot of daylight between that and your business plan. Because if you talk about who you are and what you're doing, um, you know, your, your uh, d- dynasty agency guy is, uh, is a great example because that is, uh, that's, that's really what the business is. And the brand is just kind of how that's packaged and taken to the public. And there's not a lot of daylight there. Mm-hmm. Nick, one simple exercise I found, and I literally found this like 20 years ago out of a book, and I couldn't even tell you the name of the book, and I couldn't even tell you the authors, which I feel bad about because I'm totally lifting this exercise <laughs> in, in positioning from them, but it really, really works um, to, uh, to establish the conversation to get a company thinking about you know, what they really deliver, and it's answering four questions. And so the first question is, what category does your brand play in? You know, what just overall 50,000 foot category do you play in? Um, no, I'm sorry. Let me let me start that again. I'm one ahead. It's actually what industry does your brand play in? And then what category within that industry um, are you really functioning in? Then you boil down to the third step is what is your specialty within that category? And then finally, the fourth step is what is your number one specialty? What do you do better than anybody else? And I find that this is such a great way to help put them in this sort of brand positioning funnel from industry to category to specialty to number one specialty uh, that it gets them to get real with what they do or what they have to become to be able to own that particular position in the marketplace. Do you have anything similar that you, that you take your brands through? Yeah, there's, there's a couple. And uh, I'm, I'm going to make you look bad because I can, I can source both of mine. But um, uh, I don't don't hold that as a badge of honor. Most people can make me look bad pretty easily. <laughs> I kid, but it's only because I'm I'm uh, teaching this and just put together some new material. So I had to had to do some digging. But uh, uh, and it's it's all question based stuff. But um, uh, one, especially if you are an existing brand and you feel like you need to be somewhere else, I, I love uh, Dory Clark uh, asks. Um, where are you now and where do you want to be? And I think that that can be a great point of kicking off to help you realize, um, you know, directionally where you want to go with things. And uh, another one kind of drilled down even further from there is uh, Denise Lee Yone, uh, who has a a book called What Great Brands Do, uh, asks, uh, what business are you really in? Because I think if you look at great brands, uh, we see that what they're really known for, it kind of gets at your specialty thing uh, without doing uh, the homework of the other questions. And I think if you had trouble answering hers, you could ladder it up uh, some of those other ones you're asking. But if we look at great brands, a lot of times what they're really known for isn't just the thing that they make, the widget that they're stamping out. I mean, I think... Um, if you look at Ben and Jerry's, they're not just ice cream. Zappos isn't just shoes. You know, those might be the categories that we'd put them in, uh, but it's really more than what their brand stands for. 
Who do you think does a particularly good job in brand positioning? Um, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm back to the Super Bowl because it's top of mind, but I think Dollar Shave Club does a great job of it. Yeah. Uh, it was fun to see, you know, they have had such great online videos. You know, I, I you know, always told their kind of uh, scrappy uh, uh, branding and content story that that first ad that, or that first video that has the guy going through kind of their whole factory and doing a great a somewhat edgy monologue about, you know, where they, you know, really where they stand. It's a, it's a great positioning uh, video because they talk about, you know, quit sh- paying for shave tech that you don't need, you know, all these different razors and, you know, your grad, <laughs> I think he says at one point that your granddad had one blade and polio <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a great kind of rewiring of the billion dollar shaving industry out there that's you know precipitated on you know buying a handle uh and then continuing to buy cheaper but yet not cheaper made blades and they kind of flip the market around there and of course they but uh i i bring that up in the scrappy context because uh that ad that viral video i call it an ad it was a video uh, online that really only cost them four thousand dollars because the owner uh, back to our storytelling, the other thing beyond like the McKee uh, seminar, I always tell people to get to an improv class um, because kind of some of the basic uh, storytelling and co-creating uh, principles that you'll find in an improv class are incredibly useful. And this guy used them to put together uh, really this first opening salvo, this story that he told about his business. I uh, had friends from improv class make it and had a local uh, production house shoot it and it ended up being about four or five thousand dollars it was online but it was shared everywhere it's kind of the epitome of uh of that word that we all hate uh, of the viral video but mm-hmm. you see that they've actually um gone up to uh producing a super bowl spot this year and the funny thing was they continued that story uh online if you follow them on instagram uh, they had a kind of side story about their Super Bowl ad because they are kind of this small, scrappy brand. And it could engender that kind of, hey, what are you doing with a Super Bowl spot kind of thinking? And they saw that um, or it kind of headed that off at the pass by starting a story uh, online on Instagram using the hashtag Supercuts that showed like a picture of the toilet paper dispenser at their office with a little sticky note up there saying, we have cuts from our Super Bowl ad. Please limit yourself to uh, one or two ply. And they had a, a mattress in their um, in their conference room, a picture of that. And they said, uh, hashtag super cuts. Uh, we've now listed our conference room on Airbnb. So uh, continuing that, that wry story, but also I think very strategically heading off at the past. Any thoughts that they were becoming a kind of bigger is better brand? And I think in, in telling of their story, you bring up a very good point that in digital marketing, it is so dimensional now. It's so visceral. It's no longer just a TV spot that you watch and connect with and laugh at, and then you're done. It's very, very fleeting window shopping marketing. But now how you can dive into all these different channels and make that story live on and get your customers to be active participants in the stories, whether they are a protagonist in it or an antagonist. It just is all in how you present that story online. Absolutely. Yeah, fun stuff. Well, um, let's take one more break for our sponsors. And when we come back, Nick, I want to wrap this all together. So we started with your book. We're going to end with your book. In the middle, we've had some wonderful insights into brand positioning. Now what I want is to hear from you out of, of getting scrappy how – uh, can we put this to play in our jobs today? Well, as soon as I'm done listening to this, what are a few tips and tricks that I can do to become bi- better at my digital storytelling marketing? So we'll be back right after this. Hey, if you like what you're hearing here on Business of Story, then you are going to love Definitive, the email from Convince and Convert that many marketers say is the most useful resource around. Each day, the team at Convince and Convert picks a topic and sends you the three best resources ever created about that topic. It's topical, it's timely, it's useful, so go to definitivedigest.com 
and subscribe for free right now. To tell effective business stories means to truly understand your audience, beckon them in with a story they care about, convert them into a customer, and then nurture that relationship for lifelong brand bonding. That's not always easy to do, but marketing automation has made it easier than ever. The challenge is, how do you take all that data and turn it into drama? Well, the marketing gods over at Oracle Marketing Cloud have done that for us. They've created this easy-to-read and easy-to-digest guide called Marketing Automation Simplified Guide. It offers an introduction to the five tenets of modern marketing and breaks down the tips marketers need to know to automate and optimize. This includes data in targeting, email marketing, lead nurturing, lead scoring, content marketing, and sales enablement. So to get your free Oracle Marketing Cloud Guide, Marketing Automation Simplified, go to bit.ly forward slash Oracle Automation. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Oracle Automation and start getting your brand story straight. And welcome back, everyone, to Business of Story. And our guest today, Nick Westergaard, who is a brand strategist, best-selling author, and higher ed teacher all about brand story strategy positioning in digital. And Nick, you've got an amazing new book coming out, Get Scrappy, Smarter Digital Marketing for Businesses Big and Small. So as we were promising at the top of the show, can you give us three or four or five or 50 tips on how we can get better at our digital marketing right now? Yeah, well, fifty tips. Fifty tips. <laughs> I, 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 I simplify. I'll, I know. Simplify. I'm going to say, I crack my knuckles here and just uh, start listing them off. It, if, uh, I guess get the book marketing... for the fifty tips. <laughs> right. Um, no, but I mean, I think this is the 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 big picture stuff. I mean, I, I think where we've been talking is is the 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 kind of exact progression. I, I take the class there because after the digital dynamics of things like content. We kind of end talking about your total brand experience, and that's also where the book closes, too, of bringing all of this together. Because I think, like we were talking about with the Dollar Shave Club, I think that you could look at that Super Bowl spot in isolation, but the overall experience of that is that it's part of a system born from this viral video that is continued in fun things that's shared um, on um, uh uh, on on Instagram, but also in the I'm, I'm a member of Dollar Shave Club. Disclosure: uh, They also, you know, the 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 individual touch points, the the things that they uh, the little boxes um, that they that they send you your razors in uh, have fun little messages. They have um, I forget the name of it. They have uh, a little paper newsletter that they send out in there that is a um, you know that is. Uh, I, it's got a clever name, but it's basically designed to be read on the toilet. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think about all of these things. And I think as we push to digital, I think it's important to take a step back and make sure that we, um, you know, don't fall prey to the, the Maslow's cautionary tale that, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, that uh, the real in-person interactions that we're having uh, matter just as much too. And you know how we can connect what we're doing online with what's happening in person is, is an absolutely critical step. So I think sometimes one of the biggest steps that we can take uh, as we talk about story, we'll get uh, some literature baked in here. You know, I, I say it's the Atticus Finch rule of marketing that we have to walk a mile in our customers' shoes. And I think sometimes going back and auditing our brand experience uh, online, clearing out our cookies and um, walking into our, our online store, our website, and you know, completing those forms that, you know, all of those things that trigger all of the personalization that may happen later in the game and see what that's like and see if there's holes in that experience. And I would advise uh, you to do the same thing offline. You know, are there packages that are sent out? What is that experience like? You know, are you telling your story uh, on that little box of razors? Because Dollar Shave Club is. And I think sometimes we think about those little moments as, ah, it's just a box. It's just a box. Just ship it. We move so fast today. And, you know, I, I know that sounds kind of... Uh, I'm old and, and cranky of me, <laughs> but uh, 
but you know, it, these, these little moments are, um, you know, they, they do have those ripples. Um, and, uh, you know, the little things do matter. And when you ladder that all the way up to your bigger brand experience, every little touch point along the way, everything that is sent out, every automated email, everything that's easy to say, nope, that's not marketing, is totally marketing and probably a bigger deal than, you know, that one big thing that you're sweating over that you think is probably bigger than it really is. Yeah, I I hear you. I think every touch point is marking. And I, I wrote a little note to myself here. It's not just a box. It's literally a billboard going out. Um, yeah. At our office, we um, are adjacent to a very popular uh, Asian restaurant called Payway. And uh, when we first bought the building where we are now, we would get overrun in the parking lot with people coming to Payway for lunch, and they take all of our parking spots. So our um, office. Uh, manager at the time was sort of pissed off about this. And she pulled out this don't park here sign, you know, ordinance this, and we're going to tow you and all that. And I said, (laughs) yeah, we could put that up. That's kind of what they would expect. And then we would just anger everybody. But what if we actually made a story out of it? So we handed it off to our copywriter, Dan, and said, Dan, what, you know, what's the story that that we (laughs) want to tell around parking? And he came up with the most beautiful um, no parking sign. And it says, if you plan to park here for payway, we will have you for lunch. And then we even made up our fictitious Phoenix parking ordinance at the bottom that says, ain't no lunch for you. Um, and instead of people getting pissed off, number one, nobody parks in our parking lot anymore. But people actually congratulate us on going the extra effort and turning a no parking sign into a fun experience that tells them essentially, don't park here. Or we're going to have you for lunch. So- <laughs> you know, just one of those kind of fun things that there was an opportunity to tell a story, just like the Dollar Shave Club um, tells a story in their box. I think, you know, you make a great point with that. Well, and it makes me that your parking story makes me think of uh, Panchero's uh, Mexican Grill. It's a, a uh, Tex-Mex chain here in the in the Midwest, and um, they have uh, bottles of hot sauce uh, that people were stealing Anyways, and it's like uh, on one hand, on the they thought, okay, well, we're not going to get fired up about that. But then they thought, but what if we just told them we said we knew people were going to steal them, and we just acknowledged that on the packaging. So they did something uh, very similar and 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 fun there, and uh, it makes me think. Also, you talk about all of these little touch points, the a parking sign. Uh, and there's digital versions of that too. You know, how many things do we order online and we get a package tracking email after it, the fact, uh, Warby Parker, uh, who, you know, you do home try-ons and order glasses online. Uh, they send that, that same boring, doesn't have to be boring email, uh, with your UPS tracking number. And their subject line is, let the obsessive package tracking begin. (laughs) And it wasn't hard to do that. It's just that most people don't think of it. Mm -hmm. But it's it's the difference between uh, this experience stuff that um, might get the exact numbers wrong, but there's a stat out there uh, that says that, you know, something like 70, 80 percent of us marketers agree that dollars spent on experience are better spent than on you know, traditional Marcom expenditures, but then only 15% of us actually feel like we're good at experience. So there's a lot of room for improvement, but improvement's hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting. You're right. I think that we don't give ourselves enough credit for the experience because all you have to do is sit down. Um, Anybody could do this, take out a piece of paper and on the left side, write down from start to finish the touch points of your brand from someone first finds you through awareness and they click on what and go through and just make your list. And it's okay. I think if you overlook something and leave some holes out, you're going to end up with 10 touch points, no problem at all. You know, those are the first ones that come to mind. And then here's a really simple thing you can do on the right side, write a joke for each one of those touch points, a a joke line, you know, take it, you know, be a little bit lighthearted with it. Now, granted, not everything's a joke and it may not be appropriate, but what I found that it does is it opens up that fun, the gut, the emotional side and see if you can't do something just like you said uh, about, you know, let the obsessive 
uh, tracking begin. Um, and, and to go through that, and all of a sudden, I think people will have these little aha moments of these wonderful little touch points of literally owning that moment in the customer experience, which actually invites them to be a part of the story. So again, you're no longer just promoting at them, but you're inviting them, beckoning them in to being a part of the story through an inside joke, if you will, that they're going to get. They connect the dots and they're right there with you. Um, and it goes back to what you had said early in the show about you know digital is such a dimensional storytelling realm. It's no longer one, one dimension of just promoting, but getting these dimensional elements of producing meaningful content, and then getting your listeners and viewers and customers to participate in that story. You know, kind of picking up on that, if you have your list of 10, um, I, I think, you know, leave it to a, a consultant and uh, uh, educator. We're, we're framework people. But if you have your list of 10, I think banking some quick wins is a great way to proceed. So you could take that kind of tried and true uh, axis of, you know, effort, uh, low effort, high effort, whether it's an easy thing to do or a hard thing to do, and then the impact that has on your customers and have that as your kind of X, Y axis, plot your 10 things there. And if you find some things that are low effort and high impact, maybe it is that tracking email. Wow, everybody that orders our product gets that. So it's high impact and we can change that in two minutes. So it's low effort. Plug that joke in that you uh, just referenced coming up with and do about three of those things, those high impact, low effort things. And you're going to go a long ways towards improving your overall brand experience. Great idea. Great points. Well, Nick, thank you for being on the business of story this week. And uh, tell us where can people get, get scrappy, your new book coming out. They can find everything they need to know at GetScrappyBook.com. There's pre-order info, and uh, I learned from the master, from the, the godfather of this podcast and book sales, Jay Bear, uh, on pre-order incentives and bonuses. And so there's all kinds of things there. Even if you just buy one book early, there are digital extras uh, that I've put together. Uh, the book features uh, is kind of accented by drawings from me. So I put together a scrappy sketchbook. There is a scrappy summary, uh, all kinds of other things, um, as well as some free passes to the social brand forum, uh, our event uh, that is this fall that features Jay and, and other digital marketing and branding thought leaders. Um, but everything you can find right there at Get Scrappy Book. Dot com, And you can find more info on me and what I'm up to at branddrivendigital.com. All right. Well, thanks so much, Nick. Uh, congratulations and good luck on the book. Again, I can't wait to get it out. So hopefully it'll turn my digital strategy from a crisis plan into something that's actually manageable. Really looking forward to that. And uh, for the rest of you, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Business of Story. If you like what you're hearing, Please share it with the world. Go to iTunes and give us a rating and a ranking and a note. And uh, if there's anything that you would like for me to be covering with you, feel free to reach out to me at park at businessofstory.com. So thank you all for listening. And until next Wednesday, have a wonderful life. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Emma, Act, and by Convince and & Convert, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts.